This is the first of two videos looking at sequencing and genomics. In this first video, we're going to look at how to sequence a short fragment of DNA using the Sanger technique. And in the second of these two videos, we're going to look at how to use this technique to sequence a whole genome. And we'll look at the applications of genomics. So let's start off with a 1977 Sanger technique, also known as the chain termination method. Make sure you've got this PowerPoint printed off so that you can take notes down the side as we're going. The other thing you'll need to do before going much further is to revise the steps of PCR, that is polymerase chain reaction. That is because the Sanger technique relies on interrupted PCR uh, in order to uh, find out where individual bases are on a strand of DNA. To do this, I recommend you go to your notes. Uh, also, you could uh, watch the video I've made on PCR. Uh, that is uh, available on YouTube. You'll find links in the student work area, etc., etc. So, in summary, the Sanger technique is interrupted PCR, uh, and then we find out where those interruptions have occurred. It's going to give strands of different lengths. We can find out that length by gel electrophoresis. Uh, again, a, a more detailed exposition of gel electrophoresis will be found on the videos on DNA fingerprinting, I believe, in part two. And that's going to give us our base sequence on one strand. And we need to know some base sequences to generate our primers. Let's have a look why. Gel electrophoresis, in summary. The, gel, the DNA is cut into fragments of differing lengths by restriction enzymes. Then we load our samples into wells in agarose gel. Here we go, loading it up. Uh, that'll have to happen under our buffer in the uh, bath itself. Uh, and then you pass a current through that buffer. Now DNA is negatively charged. Uh, it's negatively charged because the phosphate groups carry a double negative charge. And therefore the DNA will migrate away from the cathode towards the positively charged anode. Our small fragments move most quickly because they can wriggle their way around the uh, individual fibers uh, in uh, this agarose gel. And then we can move those fragments onto a nitrocellulose sheet or equivalent using southern blotting. Just a little bit on southern blotting quickly. It's not really rocket science, southern blotting, has to be said. Where's my cursor? Here we go. So. We've got our agarose gel there. Uh, it's all sitting on a big lump of plastic, and we've got our buffer solution here. This is a bit of filter paper, and by capillary action, the buffer will soak into the filter paper and will then soak up through the agarose gel. It'll soak all the way up to this absorbent paper. Uh, it, essentially, you whack a whole load of tissue paper on top of your gel, you weigh it down to squeeze it, and then you let buffer soak all the way up and through it. As it soaks up and through, the DNA, which is in this agarose gel, let's say we've got a band of DNA at this point in the agarose gel, that will be moved by the buffer, as the buffer goes up to there, up onto this nylon membrane. The DNA can't pass through that nylon membrane, uh, and so it just gets stuck on the nylon membrane, and we have an imprint of that gel imprint of the DNA uh, in that gel into the nylon membrane. And that takes us on to this technique, the Sanger technique. Now these uh, pictures you'll find in your OCR textbook. Uh, they're taken from uh, a PowerPoint uh, on that uh, textbook. So we've got to start with a primer. We have to know a bit of the sequence of the DNA strand that we're looking at. So we have a, a bit of known sequence here and an unknown sequence here. This is what we're trying to find out. As with PCR, we need a primer. We need that primer because DNA polymerase will not bind to single-stranded DNA. It needs double-stranded DNA onto which to bind. And then we have these free nucleotides around. These are DNA nucleotides. Here's my cursor. There we go. Um, 
DNA nucleotide, G, T, A, etc. Now, remember, this is a DNA nucleotide. It's a triphosphate nucleotide. We need those uh, triphosphates, those three phosphate groups, in order to give us the energy to form the phosphodiester bonds that we're going to make uh, when we uh, join all these nucleotides together. So this letter G here really represents deoxyGTP. The T will represent deoxyTTP. We also have here fluorescently tagged terminator bases. Fluorescently tagged terminator bases. Now these have been chemically altered so that you can't add more onto them. You cannot take... Where's my cursor gone? Here we go. If this binds on, let's say into this position here, you cannot add further nucleotides onto it. It's been chemically altered to block any more coming on. So you can't make any more phosphodiester bonds. So strands will form along here until by chance they happen to integrate a terminal nucleotide, a terminator, sorry, a terminator nucleotide. And at that point, replication ceases. What's the application of that? If a term terminator nucleotide has been integrated into a strand, the strand will fluoresce at the wavelength of that tag. These terminator nucleotides fluoresce. They fluoresce at a particular wavelength. So C will fluoresce at a different wavelength to A, different to T, uh, and different to G. Therefore, that nucleotide base acts as a marker for that strand. What we can then do is find out the length of that strand in base pairs using gel electrophoresis. So, this strand, we would know from gel electrophoresis that it was the primer plus one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine bases because it fluoresces at this particular wavelength, let's call it green, no, that's not a wavelength, it's a colour, uh, we know that C occurs at this point, that many bases up from the known primer. And therefore we know that there is a G opposite it in this position. And we've unlocked a piece of information, we've unlocked that there is a G here. We've got these unknown at the moment, but we've got that, that there is a G. And then, of course, all you do is you've got a whole family of uh, DNA fragments of different lengths, and you run a great big gel, and you've got these patterns of fluorescence down here, and they tell you which is at which point. This uh, sequencing method is effective for uh, fragments which are up to well, between 750 and uh, 1,000 base pairs. Beyond that, you've got to be a little more clever and you've got to start slotting things together and doing jigsaw puzzles. And that's what we'll think about in the second video.